Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Um, thank you for joining the Career Center Center programming in today's session, um, Future Work, Creating Change Through Law. Um, my name is Shannon Siever, and I serve as the Associate Director and Pre-Law Advisor for the Career Center. And I couldn't be more thrilled um, to be moderating today's panel and our phenomenal lineup of panelists. So without further ado, I'm going to um, basically the rodeo, um, the agenda for this afternoon's um, panel. Um, what we will do, what I will do is I will do brief introductions and then I'm going to turn it over to our um, four panelists and they're each going to take five minutes um, to address a few questions, which I'll um, state in just a moment. And then we'll have a moderated panel and then we're going to turn it over to Q&A. Thank you to all those, um, those of you who have shared questions um, for us in advance. I will then start answering some of those questions as many as I can in our allotted time. But for those of you who didn't have time to submit questions, please feel free to submit a question in the chat box. Um, you can send it to Susanna Kren privately um, if you like, if you'd like to remain anonymous, um, but you can also send it to the whole group as well. And then I will try to address some of those um, once we get to the Q&A. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists and for taking time during this crazy time. I hope everyone is um, staying safe and healthy. Um, so thank you. Um, but with us today, we have um, Janelle Dempsey. Um, Janelle graduated with a BA in um, child development and now works um, as, a, um, as Ropes and Gray Justice Fellow with the Lawyers for Civil Rights. Um, we are also joined by Laura Adedin. Adedin? Excuse Adedin. me. Adedin. <laughs> Adedin. Um, who um, received her bachelor's degree in international relations and now serves as chief special counsel for ethics, risk, and compliance with the Office of Governor Cuomo. Um, we're also joined, joined by Yolanda Fair, who received her bachelor's as well in international relations and now serves as assistant public defender with Buncombe County Public Defender's Office. And lastly, we're joined by Laura Rotolo, who received, um, she's actually a double jumbo. She received her bachelor's degree in international relations, as well as a master's in law and diplomacy um, with Fletcher, and now serves as staff counsel and community advocate with the ACLU of Massachusetts. So thank you all for being um, with us this afternoon. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists. Um, and if each of you could take five minutes um, to address um, four pieces. Um, and let me know if you need me to repeat. But the four pieces I'm hoping you can address in the introduction is your current employer and occupation, a little bit what you do in your day-to-day -day work. Um, what have you done since graduating from Tufts? Um, what were, you know, were there any pivot points from Tufts to where you are now? Three, when did you know you wanted to go to law school? Did you know what career path you wanted to pursue upon graduation? And lastly, what experiences outside the classroom were valuable and helped to inform your path. Um, so we can start it off with Janelle. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today. So as Shannon said, I am a fellow at Lawyers for Civil Rights in Boston. And my work there focuses mostly on education related issues and situations where students are somehow facing barriers to accessing their education. Um, in my role, I also do a lot of work around voting, so election protection um, and voting rights. And I also do some work on hate crimes. And I also just fill in wherever and whenever I'm needed on other projects. So my practice is, is somewhat varied and I really do enjoy that. Um, I, unlike a lot of people, did not know that I wanted to go to law school when I, when I graduated from Tufts. I, I worked for about five years before I went to law school. And to be honest, law school was really not on my radar at all. I, when I was at Tufts, I considered a PhD in pediatric clinical psychology. And after college, I worked at Mass General as a clinical research coordinator, and I did pediatric public health research. 
During that time, I also thought about medical school. I started doing a post back at Harvard Extension. Um, and, you know, over the years, lots of people had, had asked me, you know, why don't you go to law school? You, you'd be a good lawyer. You should, you should go to law school. And I, I, for whatever reason, really did not want to be a lawyer or thought that I didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, so I brushed that off. And it wasn't until I met an attorney who practiced special ed law um, and learned that that was a thing that I decided to go to law school. And it was really when I, I saw a practice area education um, where I felt like I could, I could be fulfilled and I could do a really good job at it that I saw myself pursuing this career path. And I think that that really helped me once I was in law school to stay focused and to be able to put in the work and the energy that law school requires. And I actually really enjoyed law school. Um, and I think there were some other questions that you wanted us to address. Um, experience, oh, experiences outside the classroom that I found valuable. Um, I found, so I, my degree was in child development and I love working for and with children. So I took advantage of a lot of opportunities for internships and, um, and that allowed me to work directly with, with students. And I had a couple of internships at Tufts Medical Center in the child life division or unit of the pediatric um, hematology oncology clinic. And it was very intense, um, but I, I really enjoyed it. And that helped me realize um, just you know the the wide range of areas where I could I could make a difference and sort of framed my thinking around um, just thinking thinking more broadly and and keeping an open mind about about how I could make a difference um, and you know I think that the classes that allowed me to to do that were really really valuable I also volunteered um, I volunteered at an organization in Arlington which was really close to Tufts um, and, you know, just getting out in the community and, and meeting people and learning about their lives, I think really helped shape um, those years and which absolutely has had an impact on my career now. Thanks, Janelle. And now we'll turn it over to Laura. It is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We have, we have uh, two Lauras today. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so I am the Chief Special Counsel for Ethics, Risk, and Compliance in Governor Cuomo's office. Um, and it goes without saying that my comments today are uh, my own only and represent my views and, and not the governor's or the governor's office. Um, I've been in that role for a little more than a year and a half, and I supervise a team of 30 attorneys. Uh, they have dual reporting. Uh, up to me in the governor's office and then up to the head of the individual agencies where they are embedded. Um, they, uh, their job basically is to ensure that nothing gets in the way of the agency meeting its mission. Uh, in some way they are uh, clearing landmines. They're getting out ahead of things before they blow up. Um, and when things sometimes do blow up, they go, they take a look at what happened, and then they uh, help change process uh, and operations so that um, it doesn't blow up the next time. Um, and it's, it's a very different job than the jobs I've had uh, prior to coming to the governor's office. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Because um, Shannon, one of the questions you had was, what have we done since graduating from Tufts? So I knew all along that I wanted to go to law school. Um, I was the person in my family who was supposed to go to law school. I think uh, partly by dint of personality. Um, I really enjoy uh, public speaking. Uh, I was very focused on uh, equity issues, even as a young child. Um, and so I knew I wanted to go to law school, but at the time I was advised that if I, would, if I wanted to apply to top tier law schools, I should work for a couple of years. And then that was something that the law schools wanted to see. Um, and at least that it would certainly strengthen my application to have a couple years worth of work under my belt. Um, 
So in terms of what I did before I went to law school, um, one of the things I spent a lot of time on in Tufts was working with Torn Ticket. Um, and um, I see uh, Laura nodding her head too. Um, and it was, um, uh, I really loved uh, performing um, and producing. Um, and I also was part of the Tufts Black Theater Company. Um, so that was really, that experience was really the marriage of um, my interest in social justice and the theater. So um, right after law school, uh, right after Tufts, I moved to New York and I worked for um, uh, Circle in the Square Theater, which is a Broadway theater, a nonprofit Broadway theater. I was assistant to the producer. And um, I realized that when I wasn't performing and I was just working on the producing end, it wasn't as fulfilling for me. And it was a little bit of, of a tease to be that close to the creative process and not doing something creative. Um, but I also realized that I didn't want to pursue a career in the theater. And I think um, there are a lot of recovering theater people who go to law school. Um, <laughs> I see Janelle raising her hand. Um, and I think that's partly because, um, you know, the, the things that draw us to the theater, being interested in the lives of other people, um, being storytellers, being interested in how to connect with other people, those are all qualities that make for good lawyers. Um, so, um, so anyway, I, I worked uh, in this Broadway theater and decided to leave theater before I didn't like the theater or theater people anymore. Um, and um, instead, by chance, I got a job uh, working as um, a, the deputy campaign manager for a congressional race on Long Island. And um, that job was really interesting. It was, I was working for a Democrat and the, at the time the district was registered two to one Republican. Um, we came within a hair's breadth of winning that race, um, but we lost to uh, someone who has been in Congress uh, since that time, since 1992. Um, and is just announced he's not uh, running again. Um, so we could do a whole separate conversation about that. It was a really fascinating experience. Um, and then after my candidate lost, I went to, uh, I was the executive director of the local Democratic Party, um, also at a time when we were the underdog. Uh, now in Nassau County on Long Island, uh, the, the leadership there is, uh, is, is the Democratic Party, but at the time it was very heavily Republican. So um, I, I clearly enjoy being an underdog um, and a bit of a gadfly. So uh, when I decided to go to law school, um, I went to the University of Chicago, which is um, a famously conservative law school. Um, and um, I went as someone with very liberal politics because I felt like it's, it's no fun to kind of just talk to people who agree with you and think like you. And, um, and in some ways, the, the best way to do learning is by engaging with people who think really differently from you. Um, and I've actually found that those, some of those lessons I've learned by going to um, a law school with a conservative bent have been so helpful to me in my life. Um, because it helps me understand where other people are coming from and get in their head and anticipate what they're going to say and do um, and, and um, engage uh, despite uh, those differences. Um, so in terms of other experiences at, outside the classroom at Tufts that were really meaningful for me and on my path, uh, I would say other than Torn Ticket, I was on the ex-college board and um, that was incredibly uh, enriching experience, especially learning how to um, work with people in authority because the faculty and the students were really treated as equals in that process. Um, and then um, uh, I was a member of the Black Jewish Coalition and uh, an organization called SOFA, which is a very clever acronym that stood for Students Organized for Awareness, and that was focused on racial justice issues. Uh, on campus. And I think those experiences stand out in particular as being so impactful on me. I grew up somewhere that was very homogenous, um, but was always drawn to communities that have been marginalized. Um, and, but I had a lot of learning to do. Um, and I, uh, I was able to do that at Tufts. Uh, in part through my work with those organizations. And so I knew that going to law school and coming out the other side, I'd want to do something that was social justice focused. Um, I don't know where I am on time. 
Am I am I at time? Okay. So um, I, you know, I'll just take one more minute to say that um, uh, I, when I after I went to law school, I clerked for a judge uh, in the Southern District of New York, and and then I was really at loose ends, and I didn't know uh, what I wanted to do work wise. And so to people who are um, you know, on the call who are not sure what they want to do right now. Um, I, I always envy people who were really focused and knew exactly what they wanted to do. Um, but I think, uh, like Janelle, I, I really had a more circuitous route to finding my way. And um, advice that was given to me that was very, very helpful at the time was to take my resume and put it aside uh, and really not look at it or reference it and, um, and ask myself, what do I really love about the world? and what really makes me crazy about the world and go pick one of those things and work on that. And so that answering that question, which we'll be of time later, I can talk more about, decided my path uh, post law school um, and, uh, and led me to where I am today. Thank you so much, Laura. Now we're gonna turn it over to Yolanda. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Yolanda. I graduated in 2009, um, and I took a year off from law school and then went to law school and graduated in 2013. And so now I'm assistant assistant public defender here in Asheville, North Carolina, where I live. Um, I am from Durham, North Carolina, so I, I went to Boston and then came back to the state after law school. Um, and so in my day-to-day -day work now, I represent people who are charged with speeding tickets to as serious as my highest case right now would be assault with the intent to kill. And so I, I can represent people from little, I guess, traffic tickets to a more serious felony cases. And when I started in this role, I represented mostly juveniles and that's what kind of attracted me to this job. I um, kind of had a fondness for representing kids who were caught up in the criminal justice system. And then as I've, I've been here now for about six years and kind of grown with the caseload in this office. And so, um, I think if you would have talked to me at Tufts and you would have said, Yolanda, you're going to be a public defender, a trial attorney in court every day, I would have looked at you like you were crazy because <laughs> that's not what I thought that I was going to be doing at Tufts. I thought that I was going to probably be um, an ambassador somewhere doing something international relations related because that's what I majored in there. Um, but I think as you've heard from before and Janelle, life kind of puts you in different places. And so I ended up here kind of by virtue of law school. Um, but yeah, so in my current job, I am a public defender. I am in court pretty much every day. I am a trial attorney. And so I probably try about five to six jury trials a year. Um, and I would say I probably have somewhere between um, 50 to 150 cases at a time here in my office. That's probably a lower caseload from some public defender offices in the country. I think if you probably look in the news, you'll see people like in Louisiana and New Orleans, have they've had, um, sued different governmental agencies because their caseloads have been too high. Um, but I'm very lucky that my caseload isn't uh, too crazy in where I'm at. Um, I also, in my current role, am the chair of our county's racial equity committee. And so a lot of my, a lot of my work is spent in the courtroom, but the other part of it is, is trying to figure out ways to reform our criminal justice system. And so right now I meet with a team of local elected officials, as well as people within the system and community members to see what we can do to make our system better and more equitable. How can we um, meet at this particular important time in history to make our system accessible to people, um, culturally competent to people, but also just make it fair? Because <laughs> right now I would think that a lot of people know that it's not necessarily fair, especially if you're coming in to a system where black and brown people are often charged more aggressively and earlier in life than people of other races. And so that's a, a large part of my job as well. Um, so after Tufts, I took a year off and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I had been told very similarly to Janelle that you make a good lawyer, you do all these things. But again, I'm, I'm more of an introvert or quieter person and I didn't think that that was gonna be my skill. <laughs> um, and so I took a year off. I worked at a, hunger, a Stop Hunger nonprofit in Raleigh, North Carolina. I also did a little bit of internships because I was trying to figure out, do I fit better in government? Do I fit better in nonprofit? Do I fit better in the corporate sphere? And so I worked at the nonprofit and also worked at a publishing company in Raleigh to kind of get the nonprofit and corporate sector. Then I interned at my local district attorney's office to see if I saw myself in the criminal law system. Um, and then after that year, I applied and went to law school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
And um, even in that space, I was like, I'm not going to be a trial attorney. That's not my thing. I'm going to do something different. And then I did internships when I was in law school. One in particular, I was working with um, the juvenile courts in Raleigh and Chapel Hill and just fell in love with that work. Um, I remember my first client was a 12 year old girl who had been charged with assault um, and it was against her a classmate at school. Um, but just learning about her life and the history that had gone through getting her there was probably the first time for me that I felt like I could represent someone. I could be her advocate in court. I can, you know, make her story come alive to the judge and to the prosecutor. And I knew that at least in that space, I, that's, that's kind of work that I was meant for, being able to be a storyteller for clients and people who, were, who didn't have that other person to be a storyteller for them. And so after law school, I applied to this office and I've been here ever since so far. Um, and the thing I would say to people who are on the call right now is I would say be open um, to different paths. I think, you know, if I, Tough Yolanda probably would have been a little bit different from public defender Yolanda, um, just in the sense of I, I didn't think I would be a litigator. Um, but, you know, I think you will gain the skills, you'll gain the skills necessary um, to do whatever you decide to do career path wise. I would say uh, my internships were very helpful for me. I interned at different criminal law type organizations, but also I did intern at a human anti human trafficking nonprofit. I interned at a um, a workers' compensation law firm, just to again see what where I fit the most. Um, and then when I was at Tufts, I took an acting class mainly because I, I heard when I was applying to law school that it would be good to be comfortable with your body <laughs> in court and things. And so I will say that that I, that was really good advice. I felt like I still use some of the tips from that acting class today. But yeah, I would say the internships, um, my clinic at law school, which was the juvenile justice law school law, law clinic probably the most impactful experiences that I had. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, and now we'll turn it over to Laura Rotolo. Hi, everyone. Um, this is so exciting. Thank you for the uh, invitation. I love, love speaking with alumni, and I can't wait to hear from the students. I just, I always think about, like, well, what are Tufts students doing today? And I actually live in Medford, Massachusetts, so I'm not far, and I do get to go to the campus to do these kind of talks more often than people who are, you know, sort of farther away. So I. I feel a little bit more of a connection and I, I just really want to hear from you all as well. Um, I feel like my story is very similar in that um, it's sort of, on the one hand, it's sort of exactly what I thought I'd be doing and on the other hand, it's totally different, you know. So I did IR um, at Tufts and I'm an immigrant from Latin America. I grew up in Nassau County, Laura, so I know what you're talking about, <laughs> Nassau County, Long Island. Um, but uh, I always thought I'd be ha have like an international career. I thought about going to the UN. I went to the Fletcher School just for that um, piece of it. Uh, I did intern at the UN, I think three times. Um, I was able to work at a nonprofit that worked within the UN, but it didn't wind up being my long-term career path. And, and now I work at the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a very American organization. There's very little international work that I get to do. But the work that I do is um, as an attorney and a, what we call a community advocate, which is sort of uh, bridging my two, um, I guess, doctrinal paths, but my, my two passions as well, which is organizing and also being a lawyer. So I get to do a little bit of both. I'm not in the courtroom. I did that for a few years and it just wasn't for me. I just don't have the nerves to like do trial work. I did one deposition once and I was like, I'm out, I'm out, I can't do this. So Yolanda, praise to you. <laughs> Um, but what I do get to do is I get to do policy work. So I write policy, I write um, local legislation, state legislation, and I get to work with policymakers um, and use that part of my legal education. But I also get to do sort of more organizing campaigns around the issues that I work on. And my main issue is immigrant rights. Um, again, I'm an immigrant myself from Latin America, and that's just been a passion of mine. It's been a way that I get to do sort of international based work but within the United States. Um, and so getting back to the questions, my title is Staff Counsel and Community Advocate. It's just this um, 
sort of, um, I think I call us unicorns. There's very few of us that do this kind of mixed work where we get to both be attorneys and organizers. Um, and the ACLU, there's just like a handful of us. And it, I think it's a really exciting uh, way to bridge those two things. I get to be like the only lawyer in a room of organizers where, you know, I get to help do the legal work, but I also get to do the very exciting campaign work that, um, that I love to do. Um, I've been at the ACLU for almost 15 years now. I don't know how that happened, but it did. Um, and again, it's like not at all international organization, but the tools that I got um, are, you know, it's the same work. It's the same work, whether you are, you know, at the UN um, trying to negotiate a treaty with delegates from all, you know, different parts of the world and sitting across from a police chief in a, a town of 2000 people in Massachusetts trying to get them to change their policies. It's like changing the way, um, you know, like working towards justice, right? Working towards social change. Um, but instead of on a global level, I get to do it on like a micro level. And I, I, I find it really, really exciting because you get to know people, you get to know communities, you get to make change like person by person. Um, and I, I, as it winds up, I actually really enjoy that. Um, just looking at the questions. Uh, so since graduating from Tufts, that was in 97, like before some of you were born, which makes me feel so old. But um, I, I worked at an immigrant rights organization and I went to the Fletcher School and I didn't um, think I was going to go to law school. But looking back and hearing from you all, it's like I definitely exhibited some of those behaviors <laughs> as a young kid. Like I was kind of a ham. I did theater as well. Um, I did Model UN, which is like a lot of public speaking and I loved it. Um, that was all my, my young life. And, um, I, nobody in my family was a lawyer, so that wasn't really a path for me because we came to the U.S. when my parents were sort of, you know, maybe college age, they never got to go to college, though they probably would have had we stayed in Argentina. Um, but I was the first one to graduate from a, a college and then to go on to grad school and, and law school. But um, after the Fletcher School, I continued to work in nonprofits or organizations, and I saw, like many of you, that a lot of the exciting work being done was being done by lawyers. Um, not always in the courtroom, but just like sitting in rooms with lawyers who had this extra tool that I really, really gravitated toward. Um, and so I saw law school as getting another tool in my toolkit, um, not really knowing what I was going to do with it, but um, I wound up um, being hired by the ACLU on a, like a part-time, uh, like on a temporary basis. And then here I am 15 years later. Um, it's not something that I ever thought would happen, but um, the ACLU is just a, a tremendously, a, a wonderful organization to work with. Um, and so that's where I am now. I'm just looking at the questions. Outside of the classroom, well, first of all, I did do international relations, but I also did peace and justice studies. And that was a certificate program at the time that I went to school. And I know that then became a major and it changed again. But I, I use my peace and justice studies background literally every day in both my work life and my personal sort of political life as I get more involved in city politics and, and everything that's happening right now. I use my peace and justice studies background all the time. And I, I really encourage people taking those courses because I feel like if you, know, if you wanna be involved in everything that's happening right now, having that history, having that analysis of social movements that came before is so incredibly helpful. Um, so I really like the Peace and Justice Studies program. Um, and also like a, a negotiations class wound up being really, really helpful later on. It turns out that a lot of what I do is negotiating with people um, to get them to, to change their policies and to make their policies better. Um, and internships also, you know, just plug what everyone has said about internships and externships being so important, especially in law school where you could do an entire three years and never do anything but read books, right? and not and like graduate from law school and not know how to file a motion. So internships, both to get you to be a, a better lawyer starting you know, right away, but also just to help you figure out what you wanna do and what you don't wanna do. Because I definitely did internships that were like, this is not for me. And that's just as helpful, I think, in choosing your career, career path than, than an internship that you, know, that you, that you love and you wanna continue with. So that's it. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, so moving on, um, we're seeing this event part as being an industry check-in. Um, these are really trying times. Um, this is a 
you know, unprecedented time here in the world being impacted in all different ways um, with the COVID era and the death of George Floyd and all the racial justice going on around the world. And so what I thought would be helpful to hear and to share with um, the current participants today is in regards to everything going on. I feel like there's always industry trends, but with everything going on, from your perspectives, what would you say if any, are there top trends you're seeing or either in how folks are responding or what you're predicting uh, might happen in um, the legal field, but, in nat but even more specifically within the work you're doing um, and those that you serve? And anybody can kick it off. I'm happy to start. Um, Thanks, so, um, and, I'll, and I'll take just a little step back, which is to tell you what I did after law school. So when I answered that question for myself about what do I love about the world or hate about the world, the first thing I said is homophobia drives me crazy. And the friend who asked me the question said, well, go work on that. And I said, yeah, but my resume, she goes, ah, uh, we're not talking about resume. You can't look at your resume. Go work on that. Um, and so the, the first job I had after my clerkship was at uh, the New York City Gay and Lesbian Anti-Violence Project, which is the largest LGBTQ crime victims agency in the country. Um, and, and um, you know, Laura gave an example where she was one of uh, the few lawyers uh, in the room. I was the only lawyer among social workers and peer advocates, and that was really important learning for me. Um, I left there, I went to the US Attorney's Office. Uh, I was a federal prosecutor. Um, and then after being home with my children for several years, um, I went to the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, uh, which is uh, an independent agency in New York City that investigates allegations of police misconduct. And I set up the prosecution unit there, which for the first time allowed civilian prosecutors to try police officers at disciplinary trials. Um, and for those of you who are from New York, Officer Pantaleo, uh, who was involved in the death of Eric Garner, was prosecuted by uh, by that unit. Um, uh, I left there to go to the Brooklyn DA's office to work in the Civil Rights Bureau where I was prosecuting hate crimes and police misconduct uh, and then eventually became the chief of the human trafficking unit. So Yolanda, you and I have that work in common. Um, and then I left there to go to the governor's office. So I think I tell you all that to say that when I started out at the anti-violence project, um, when there were um, periods of social change, big movements. Um, you know, the murder of Matthew Shepard for the LGBTQ community was one of those. The organizing that went on uh, to affect change came from established organizations. And um, now I think one trend that I'm seeing, uh, you know, not, not just for lawyers, but for lawyers working in social justice movement generally is that it's very decentralized. Right? And part of that is technology. With Instagram, I can post that I'm organizing uh, a march or a rally or a sit-in, um, or I can educate people about the work that I'm doing um, as, as an individual. Um, and, and I have a platform in a way that when I started out, I graduated in, in 1990, also as an international relations major, by the way, another thing we have in common, um, you, you couldn't do. Um, and I think that's a very significant change that's going on. So partly it's technology, partly it's by design. Black Lives Matter, by design, wanted um, organizing to be decentralized. And I think we're seeing the wisdom of that strategy right now, where you have a lot of grassroots organizing going on and where people are really engaging at a community level. Um, so for me, that's, that's a significant development in the industry. And I think that's all for the good. And especially if you're early on in your career, um, you, you have more ability now to, to affect change and to have a bigger reach than you would have when, when I was sitting where you are. Thanks, Laura. Is there anybody else that would like to add any input? I want to just add you know, in relation to what you were talking about, Shannon, that one of the other things happening in all in legal industry and probably every industry is a, an internal reckoning with the racial issues inside our own boardrooms, inside our own organizations. Even organizations like the ACLU 
we are not immune from issues around race. Um, you know, if you look at any boardroom in America, you will see mostly white people, right? Um, why is that? Why, why is that? Um, and I think, so at the ACLU, um, you know, we have a system of, we have a national office and then we have uh, every state has their own affiliate or several affiliates, depending on the size of the state. And many of us are, are unionizing. So that's one of the like sort of internal things that I see a lot of nonprofits the workers are starting to unionize. Even the attorneys were unionizing. Um, and some of that is about, uh, you know, questions about race and gender and, you know, how do we have these conversations in a way that's safe for workers to talk about? And how do we ensure that people are compensated in a way that's just? Um, so we are having these internal conversations. I have a friend who works at a, um, a tech startup that's international and they're having the same conversation like, you know, and it was sort of prompted by a competitor coming out with a statement, and, uh, you know, supporting BLM, and they went to their board and wanted a statement, and that just started a whole conversation. So I think as, you know, it's not the same, I think where we are now is not where we were when I started my career, where, you know, people were sort of hu talking hushed tones about like, why is it that our director's all white, right? Why is it that women, you know, why don't we have better policies around childcare, about flex time that help gender equality in our workplace? And now we're having these conversations out in the open and it's like painful and difficult, but I think it's going to make us better workplaces um, in all of our industries. And lawyers are not immune from that conversation right now at all. Yolanda or Janelle, would you say there's any kind of major trends or any kind of themes that you're seeing in your work right now? Uh, so I would I would agree with Laura in terms of the the conversations that are are being had um, at at my organization um, and you know specifically around flex time and working from home. I mean, it, it we've been working from home for. I don't even know how many months now and it's we will continue to work from home indefinitely um, and you know I think that LCR is is a it is a unique organization in that it is majority minority um, so our director is an immigrant um, from Costa Rica uh, he is an a out gay man um, and my boss is a black woman, which is as a black woman myself, it's incredible to, to for my supervisor to be a black woman. Um, and so I think that some of those conversations are, they're, they're happening more often in, in our organization, but I think that the way we're having them, it's different um, because of the, the racial makeup of, of the organization. Um, in terms of our day-to-day -day work, especially with COVID-19, there are just so many more issues that have arisen as a result of the pandemic. And the pandemic has really just put a, a focus on all of the inequities that have existed forever. Um, and it's just, it's just making those so much more clear to, to us and to everyone else. Um, and so a lot of the work that I've been doing recently has related to, to the pandemic and responding to the, the need to really address those, those inequities. Thank you, Janelle. Yolanda, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, well, I just, I would echo a lot of what's already been said in the sense of the conversations that are happening internally. I think that's happening in my office and some of the local agencies that I work with as well. Um, I will say that there has been, I think criminal justice reform has been a topic that has been um, kind of in the forefront for a couple of years now. And I think that's great, but I do think that COVID has put a different lens on that in some ways. I think with the fear of people in prison and in jails getting COVID and um, what that looks like has caused a lot of local jurisdictions to rethink some of their bail policies, some of their, um, just some of their who they're, who they're arresting, who they're not arresting, should they do a citation versus a warrant. So some of those conversations are happening at least in, in Asheville. Um, I know in the time that, I, since I guess March, when we had our shutdown, our first initial shutdown, 
our jail population was reduced by 40% um, through our local judges and people just either unsecuring our bonds and unsecure means the person doesn't have to post any money. Um, our cases being dismissed or um, some type of resolution to a case to get people out of the jail. And so I think now that our local jurisdiction knows that that's possible, it's trying to figure out ways to sustain that, right? And ways to um, think about different alternatives to incarcerating people in the first place. So I think that the conversation has been there. It's now in a different lens because of COVID. Um, and then on top of that, adding the racial justice issues as well. Thank you. Um, we're getting, this has been a question that's come in, but also just in general during these times, we're getting a lot of questions from students as well as alum around like wanting to really get engaged and involved in this work and the specific legal work. And I guess a question I have for you all is one, whether or not you're sophomore, junior, senior, recent alum or beyond, what might be some ways to get involved in this work if you don't have that specific legal experience and two, I feel like what I'm hearing myself say is, well, there's, you know, there, there's other experiences to gain and other skills, you know, and I feel like now is a time more than ever to be able to be flexible and be able to pivot. So I guess my question is, are, would you say there's specific experiences, but also in a way more importantly, um, yeah, what might be like skills that students um, and alum could be thinking about gaining um, that would be helpful and perhaps even that you've seen during these trying times that have been really helpful to have um, during very uh, you know um, times of uncertainty so i can i can speak to that i given that i i pivoted quite a few times um both before law school and also after law school so i like i said i i went to law school with this interest in education law that is what i'm some of what i'm doing a lot of what i'm doing now but and while i was in law school my internships i went to northeastern so there we had a full year of full-time work experience in law school and while i was there most of my co-ops um, were focused on education law which was fantastic and then when I graduated, the job that I got was as a real estate litigator um, at a boutique real estate firm. Um, so really not at all related to what I, what I was looking to do or what I started out looking to do. Um, and, but I still was able to gain a lot of really important skills that, I, that have been applicable since since leaving that firm and and now in my role at LCR, um, you know, litigation experience in any in any area is really transferable and re really useful. And I think that when I was when I was at Tufts, I'm not sure that I thought about it that way specifically, but there certainly were were skills that I focused on or that I that I built during internships and then also after Tufts in my, in my jobs at uh, MGH and then Tufts Medical Center, where I was able to, to gain, gain skills that set me apart. And even when I, was, when I was in law school and then applying for positions, I was able to speak to those skills. So, you know, working as part of a team, working independently, um, being able to, to take initiative. Those are all things that regardless of what field you're in, an employer is looking for. Um, and so I think that there are lots of opportunities to start, start building those skills long before you get to law school. Thanks, Janelle. Anybody else like to share? Yeah, I think I would just echo um, the idea of flexibility, I think that Janelle's talking about too, because I think, um, you know, I, so my dad's a police officer, so I grew up um, with that kind of, well, not frame, but just his, hearing his stories. Um, and so I always thought that if I went into criminal law, I would be a prosecutor, right? Um, just because that's, that's um, what I knew, and I always heard, heard stories from him. And so my first internship, one of my first internships was with the Durham, um, Durham County DA's office, which was a great experience, I learned a lot. Um, and I don't think had I had that experience and then the experience of the public defender's office as well 
would I have kind of known where maybe I fit into it. Um, and I also think that having that experience helps me in my day to day job now, right? Because I, I don't know, I, I don't claim to know everything that prosecutors know, but I do know a little bit from the experience that I have and that helps me with my cases. And I think vice versa, right? I'm sure some of um, the prosecutors who could use some of the experience that they learned in their other internships as well in their in their jobs now. Um, so I would say just being flexible with what you choose as your experiences, but also we're in a time where everything's really virtual and lots of people need help. And so I would say don't feel free, don't feel afraid to reach out. Um, I know if you were to reach out to our office, for example, we could always use students who are willing to research things for us. Um, we can always use students who's willing to write a memo for us, all of those things. Because at least for us, we can't have physical interns right now because of courthouse closures and things, but we could always have a student who could look up a case for us or who can um, do something like that. And I think one thing, you know, the big elephant in the room to me is for you all as when you graduate, like what the job market's gonna be like. I feel like, you know, none of us knows what possibilities are gonna be out there. Um, so like Yolanda and Janelle were both saying, you know, just do something. All of those skills are going to be helpful, right? And I don't know if you know, you're not in the position that maybe we were when we graduated, where it's like, well, I'm, I'm going to apply to a clerkship. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do an internship. I don't, I don't know what's going to be available to you when you all graduate. So um, yeah, maybe just lowering expectations a little about how like strict your, you know, your path has to be and understand that all these skills are transferable. I mean, you lot of went from like the DA's office to the public defenders, how, you know, and yet totally transferable and a fantastic way to, to do that, right? Like to get both sides um, of the story is, is making her a much better advocate, I'm sure. Um, yeah. And if you want to get involved, like locally, I'm going to do my local pitch because I'm a Medford resident. There's a lot going on in Medford that I didn't know was going on when I was a student. But now that I'm a resident, I'm a parent, I'm, I'm more involved. But Medford itself, it's having its own reckoning. You know, our city council is entirely white, one woman out of uh, seven, uh, you know, six men and one woman on city council our school committee, you know, we're, we're having these conversations. We finally have a person of color who's our superintendent. Um, and there's a fantastic group called Mobilize Medford. They're led by young Medford. Um, I think a lot of them are graduated from Medford High, you know, just a few years ago, mostly people of color, young, super energetic. Um, they're on Facebook. And, you know, if you are a person who wants to be involved in like, you know, what's happening locally, that's a really great place to be involved in. They are doing a fantastic job of holding our local leaders accountable. Um, I will also say, so Yolanda and I both graduated in 2009, which was a, a pretty bad job market. Um, there wasn't the added layer of there being a global pandemic at the same time, but you know, when I graduated, I worked as a nanny full time because I didn't have I didn't have a job. So, um, and I. I I worked as a full-time nanny for several months before I, I got a full-time position at Mass General. And I have to say that in that, in that position as a nanny, um, you know, working with, with the parents, um, the mom was a stay-at-home mom, um, and so she was there all the time. I learned a lot and I think that the skills that I built as a nanny actually really helped me when I was at a law firm and I had to deal with partners. Um, so, you know, there's, there's something to learn in every experience. Um, and, you know, it is obviously a very uncertain job market right now, but I guarantee you that things will work out and maybe, you know, you might have to take a job that, that isn't exactly what you you have in mind, but I guarantee you that there is something to learn from it, and there's a way that you can talk about it when you're in interviews that that will be meaningful and will set you apart. Thanks, Janelle. So, one question that another question that's come up quite a bit from the um, today's participants and just other folks that I've worked with who are interested in the field of law is this concern about wanting to do this social justice work, this public interest law work, but being able to, you know, balance sometimes the salary that comes with that. So a little bit of a two-part question is, 
what are your recommendations um, or do you have recommendation for how to find the right compromise between law school that opens the most oppor opportunities possible and avoiding debt if you plan on going into the social justice type of work um, as well as like yeah how do you balance that um, how do you balance change making work with making a living anybody can take this um, I can start a little bit. Um, so when I, was at, when I was applying to law school, I, I heard a lot that you should try to go to law school where you, where you might see yourself living. Um, and I'm not so sure what the advice is today. Um, but I would just say that I would try to find a school that has programs that help pay people back loan-wise. Um, so like the University of Ohio where I went, I am from North Carolina and I, I could see myself living here, right? That, that's why one of the reasons I went there, but I also was open to the ideas of moving to DC or back to Boston. But my prime thing when I considered that school was that they had, they have a program that helps people in public service pay back their loans. Um, and so I would, I would try to find a school like that just because if you know that you want to do this type of work, um, that's kind of already built into the school and kind of your future. Um, and then, you know, of course, preparing for the LSAT, preparing uh, your grades, all of that stuff will also help you with scholarships and things. But I think just going to a school that um, will support you in your endeavors. UNC also had a program that paid you to do different internships in the public service sector. And so um, if you could find a school that does things like that as well. And I know a lot of um, the top law schools now are doing things like that because mm -hmm. they're, they're encouraging a lot of this. And so I think you would find that a lot of the schools that you may be interested in. Thanks, Yolanda. And I can so, just give you my cautionary tale. Just learn from my mistakes. I'm gonna lay down, I'm gonna be honest with you all, I messed up. I took out loans for Fletcher and I took out loans for my three years of law school and that was a big mistake. I went to uh, Washington College of Law, which is you know a great school. It had all the programming I wanted. I got to go to Costa Rica to represent clients at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. The experience was amazing. And I knew that they had loan repayment help, but it just wasn't enough. Like once you start making over, I think $50,000, they cut you off. And, you know, that happens pretty quickly as, as an attorney, even in a nonprofit setting, you'll start making 50 at some point. Um, so I have over $100,000 in debt. I've been out of school for 15 years. Um, and it doesn't move. I don't know how that works, but like you're just paying interest forever. And at some point you get to the principal. I don't know when, but it's a 30-year loan. It's like a mortgage on my brain is what I call it. And uh, my my monthly loan depending on how much money you make you know i make in a year because i'm married so they take in both of our incomes it's anywhere between 700 and a thousand dollars a month so like that's forever right i am hoping that um i will qualify for the loan repayment uh for the loan forgiveness and i have like a couple more years to go there was a whole mess around that at the beginning so a lot of my payments did not qualify and i'm sort of appealing that and i'm in the process I'm hoping that my federal loans will be forgiven because I've been at a nonprofit for 10 years and paying my loans um, regularly. Um, so I'm hoping that still goes through, that Trump doesn't get rid of that program. Um, I'll still have the other half, which is my private Sally Mae loans. I was hoping if I named my first child Sally Mae, they would help, but it didn't help at all. Um, and it's a problem, you know, working at a nonprofit, we struggle, we really struggle. You know, we've had to ask help from my, my parents and my husband's parents at times for childcare, because all of a sudden you have kids and things get really expensive. And it's a real struggle. And I think looking back on it, if I had one thing to change, I would probably have gone to a state school. Um, so I, you know, because WCL was fantastic, but so was Rutgers and my parents lived in New Jersey. I could have, you know, um, I could have gone to a state school. So I think that that, that's my one sort of regret is that I'm really saddled with these loans for a very long time and I'm never going to make a lot of money at a nonprofit organization. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to plug and let you all know about a fabulous resource called accesslex.org. And if you haven't become best friends with AccessLex, do so. Um, they're a nonprofit that does a lot of financial literacy work for individuals looking to pursue um, 
a law school degree and they'll help you as pre-law as well as throughout the whole law school process and offer and they also offer free one-on-one -on -one consultations they're really there to support you and they want you to you know reach your dreams but they also just want to make sure that you're doing it in a very well informed manner when it comes to your finances um, so I'm going to be mindful of time. I could be here all afternoon with y'all. Y'all have been fantastic. I've had the time to get to a few of the Q&A, um, but I want to just take these last couple minutes to hopefully go down the line and um, thinking about the fact that we're here with students alum, um, what might be kind of a last um, final piece of advice that you'd like to share with the participants today? And anybody can take it first. I think I, I would say, you know, to to be flexible. Um, I, I know that we've talked about that a lot, but I, I do think that it's really important. People who who go to law school and become lawyers, we tend to be people who like things to to happen, you know, exactly when we want them to happen, and we have these steps that we have planned out. And you know, life just doesn't happen that way, and it's okay. Um, and you know, so just keeping that in mind and your path will, will be your path and no one else will, will walk that path. So, you know, it, it has to work for you um, and, and it will. I would Yolanda? say- Yolanda? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, yeah, I would echo a lot of what Janelle said. Um, I would say just remember in the process of becoming a lawyer to um, stay true to you and again, what your goals were, because um, I think that'll help ground you in what you want to do. Um, I think, you know, again, looking back at who I was at Tufts and who I'm at now, um, I would have never thought I would be a trial attorney doing what I do just because that's not the personality that I have on a, you know, I'm just not a loud or extroverted person. That's not me, but we all find our places and, you know, you could, you could be any type of person and do well in whatever field that you choose. And so just stay true to those main goals. And I think you'll find a path that fits you. Or I didn't. So I, I would just say two things. Uh, one is, um, advice that I would, I would uh, offer to people when I was doing anti-trafficking work and I would go and give presentations and by the time you really um, pull back the veil on the sex industry and you help people understand how sex, tra sex trafficking sits at the intersection of uh, racial inequality, gender inequality, and income inequality people are, are left devastated at the end of your presentation and then they say, what can I do, right? What, what can I do? And I think the answer I would give uh, then is the answer I'm giving you now, which is that uh, wherever you're sitting, there's work to be done and you can do it and your way into that work should be whatever is of interest to you. So if you're a theater person and you're interested in racial equity, then you can be, um, you know, uh, supporting artists of color. You can be holding the arts institutions uh, of which you are a member accountable if they are uh, not using a, a, an anti-racist lens in their work. Um, when I did anti-trafficking work, I would say, if, if, you are, if you wanna stop trafficking, then you need to be concerned about income inequality. Um, and and you can be working, you know, thinking about what Laura is saying uh, uh, at turn a turn a spotlight on your own agency and how are you are you paying people fairly? Are you creating opportunities um, for underserved communities to have um, you know uh, entrance into your institution? So from wherever you are in your community and whatever. Uh, lights you up inside generally as a person, that can be your way in uh, to doing this work. The other thing I would say is, and I came to this very late in life, um, this was my mistake, Laura, which is that I was never good at networking. I felt really uncomfortable with it. I felt like I was imposing on people, that I was using people, and that it was very inauthentic. Um, and that was much to my detriment in my career. And I learned that maybe like, 
five minutes ago that um, actually you can be authentic in your interactions um, and connect with someone whose work is interesting to you, whose personality you're drawn to, whose career path has been like yours. And A, they're not gonna feel imposed upon. Uh, they will feel uh, very grateful that their work spoke to you. And also they will get a lot out of the conversation. Um, and I can tell you as someone who has a lot of those conversations now, and I would welcome anybody who's on this call to reach out to me through LinkedIn if you want to have an offline conversation. But um, I always get so much out of those conversations, so don't feel like you're imposing. And the reality is that as someone who's now been in a position to hire people a lot, that um, it's a scary proposition to hire someone. And so if you have, um, you've had a little, uh, peek into who they are as a person in a little more of a relaxed setting. Um, you may think of them, uh, they may be top of mind when you have an opening, or you may hear about an opening and then go, oh, you know what, there was that person I met with and they just, they were so engaging, I should let them know about this opening. Um, so, you know, you use um, the access that you have, and if you are ever, when you are in a position of, of privilege in your career, I encourage you to make sure that you are making available uh, your privilege to other people. Um, and, and maybe don't wait for someone to come to you and say, hey, can you be helpful to me? But say to them, if there's any way I can be helpful to you, you know, if you want me to look at your resume, cover letter, um, if you want me to think about contacts I may have that may be helpful to you, uh, please let me know. Um, I think it's, um, it, it goes a long way. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, and I was just piggyback on that. I, I always thought I was terrible at networking, right? Because when I thought about networking, I would think about like the quintessential networking, you know, you know, happy hour or something where you go and you have to meet people and pitch yourself. And I hate that. I hate that. But looking back on my career, every job I've ever had, except for the first one I applied to, has been because I knew somebody. Because an internship led to, you know, a job led to getting to know somebody led to a fellowship led to a permanent position it's because you show your work and that's that's networking as well right it's just not like empty and transactional it's like actually getting to know people and letting people get to know your work and your passion right and then that leads to stuff so i will also echo please feel free to reach out to me and because i'm local hopefully someday we can have coffee in person i'll just drop my email i'll drop my work email in the chat because we also have a really great volunteer program at the ACLU if you want to get involved. Um, you obviously don't have to be a lawyer. We have a, a really wonderful volunteer coordinator who will get you right into our campaigns if you're interested. Um, but also I'm happy to chat with any of you. Thank you so very much. Um, I can't thank you all for this wonderful um, conversation dialogue today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, I really encourage all the participants on today's call, knowing that we didn't get to the Q&A, to please take the advice um, of your fellow Tufts Jumbos and continue the energy from today and reach out to the alum. Um, I really hope you all see this as a beginning connection, and I really encourage everyone on this call to, um, even if it's a little bit scary and daunting, to take it to the next step and continue these chats with our four alum today, but also with other Jumbos. Um, I've mentioned to our panelists and a lot of you that we launched probably now close to a year ago, The Herd, which is a flash mentoring platform. So I'd really encourage, and I really see that as like a safe space to start. There's of course LinkedIn, um, but The Herd is a wonderful place to start and engaging and connecting with your um, fellow Jumbos. So if we could give a virtual clap to all of our um, panelists today. Um, and really thank you again, and I hope everybody on this call today stays healthy, stays safe, um, and just take care. So thank you again, and have a wonderful day.